Hello, my name is Stephen Billett from Griffith University in Brisbane, Queensland. And the name of this session and its focus is on VET and work-life learning pathways. What I want to argue here is to advance the concept of individuals' pathways across working life as, per, as professional curriculums to inform the process and purposes of VET and also lifelong education. These pathways are shaped by the experiences afforded or provided through educational institutions, workplaces, communities, and selectively engaged with and appropriated by us individuals as we transcend our, our working lives. And that personal curriculums represent the totality in some sense of the experiences and the activities and interactions that constitutes our progression across work-life pathways. And they offer a means to, I think, reconceptualize curriculum from being primarily an institutional fact, i.e. that is what arises from the social world, to something inherently about us as individuals and our learning and our development. And it positions vocational and lifelong education as experiences intending to assist individuals learning periodically across work lives, particularly at key transition points. And it also suggests how VET might be positioned to effectively support working age adults progress, progress um, along their work life uh, trajectories. So how I'd like to progress is firstly, referring to some key precepts um, that helped me understand this, this, this concept, and then discussion about conceptions of curriculum and how that fits into the case I'm trying to make, and then refer to personal curriculums, elaborate those, and then provide some cases of transitions and changes for individuals learning across working life, and then finish with some implications for, for VET. Okay, well, firstly, some key uh, precepts, some basis for how we might think about these, these issues. Well, factors that mediate human learning and development can be seen as being of three kinds. Firstly, there's institutional facts, those that arise from social institutions and the social world, according to Searle. And then there are those facts that arise from nature, such as maturation, now, Sir makes the point that these are factors that exist and we cannot wish them away. They exist and we have to engage with them. And these are the factors that shape our interaction with the world and how we make sense of it. And there's also personal facts. And these are those that arise from our personal journeys across our lives. And these are person dependent in, in most ways, I think. In terms of curriculum concepts, most conceptions of curriculum can be categorized in three ways. Firstly, there's the, there's the intended curriculum. That is what's intended to occur. So you know, we have a lot of focus on national standards and national curriculum, training packages, and these are very much the intended curricula. Then there is the enacted curricula. What happens and the, what, what happens and the factors that shape what is implemented you know, the circumstances in which courses are, are, are enacted, the contributions which we as educators make, and the kind of interactions we have with particular kinds of students which shape then how these courses are implemented. And then there is the experience curriculum. That is what learners experience and learn from what is enacted. And this is perhaps, for me anyway, as somebody interested in learning and development, this is perhaps the most important conception of curriculum. And then we also have a consideration of educative experiences. That are those which are experiences which occur in education institutions, workplaces and community, communities that are structured in ways that realize robust learning. So here we're dealing with facts that shape our thinking and acting, curriculum concepts, but also a consideration, a broad consideration of educative experiences that individuals have across their working lives. 
In terms of conceptions of curriculum, the original meaning of the word curriculum was the, a pathway to follow or a course to progress along, curi. And this concept is usually taken as an institutional fact. That is, it's about achieving the goals of school, of governments, religious or professional, or even licensing authorities. That is, these are requests from the social world. And the experience curriculum provides a way of understanding the learning and development from the person who's participating in that, the individual. Yet, even the experience curriculum is usually tied to engagement in particular education experiences, what has been intended and what has been provided. And it excludes all of the learning and development that occurs outside of those programs. And so we, I think we need a concept of curriculum that can accommodate, illuminate and elaborate the pathway of learning that individuals have across their adult lives and to identify how educative experiences can guide and support that learning. So whilst institutional intentions and enactments are, are, are important and necessary, um, achieving them also understands how individuals come to engage, how learners' readiness is, the capacities they have to engage and learn, but also their interests in doing so. So personal curriculums then are essentially pathways of experiences individuals have across their lives, including, and perhaps centrally, their working lives. These are shaped by the educative experiences I've mentioned in schools, workplaces, and community, and how individuals elect to engage with these experiences and learn from them. It's important to always remember that educational experiences are nothing other than nothing more or less than an opportunity, to, an invitation to change. And it's how people take up that invitation, which is central to the learning outcomes. So these um, experiences afford particular things from the social world. These can be both positive and negative. The suggestions by the community of social institutions, schools, religion, media, government, and workplaces, these make suggestions to us, provide access to knowledge or restrict access to knowledge in particular ways. And these are also often mediated also by familiars, um, parents, uh, partners, colleagues, etc. But collectively, these affordances are exercised by social institutions and those within them. However, it's how people come to engage with what is afforded them which is important to their learning. And that engagement can be highly intentional. People can consciously and effortfully and directly engage with those experiences, or we engage sort of unintentionally, habitually in, in ways that are societally sanctioned. And these then together mediate um, how we make sense of things and how we learn um, across our lives. And this shapes also, this is also shaped by our maturation of how we, we as people, as we age, um, make sense of things in different ways and are able to make sense of things in different ways. And so it is this lifelong process of experiences that is shaped by, but also shapes um, our lifelong learning, which is referred to as ontogenetic development. The, the learning and development we have across our life course. So um, the findings I'm going to refer here come from an Australian Research Council funded project, which in its first phase has mapped 30 workers' work-life histories. And in doing so, what we've done is we've identified the transitions that these individuals have negotiated across their working lives, the changes that have initiated and been addressed in those, those transitions and the learning required to negotiate them. So these transitions that individuals encounter and negotiate across their working life accumulatively and in person-specific ways comprise these personal curriculums. They also comprise the, the development of individuals through the experiences that we have in our unique um, personal histories. And so 
learning and development then is required to negotiate these transitions and it's only partially mediated by experiences unorganized and enacted through educational institutions, i.e. lifelong learning. Much of it, as indicated, is a product of individuals, lifelong learning. So what we've found is that, yes, there's affordances that have come from engagement and learning opportunities and, um, and mediate, mediation. Um, from educational institutions at crucial points in, in individuals and um, work life history, but also in particular things that came and support and suggestions that came from individuals communities. So what are the kind of changes that these individuals have had to negotiate well we've identified six of them there's negotiations that people have had to. Um, negotiate at particular life stages of maturation which could be um, getting older or it could be having uh, responsibilities for family etc which has reshaped how they come to engage with the world and then there can be employment status shifts in work roles and responsibilities perhaps moving up into you know different kinds of roles to management or or administrative roles um, there can be changes in occupations, the demand and, and kinds of occupation, the kind of work that's available as, as the demand for occupations fluxes and you know, wanes over time. And then locations, individuals moving to new locations. And if those locations also require the development of new language, that can be a considerable transition and also learning the mores of, of, of going to new communities and countries. And then the issues of health, individual or family health have caused individuals to make decisions about their work life trans, um, trajectories. And then there's also personal preferences, individuals wanting to take new directions out of, out of choice or out of being pressed into making those, those, those choices. So when we look across these individuals, what we've found is that over these 30 informants, over 200 transitions we've been able to examine. And we've been able to identify and quantify different kinds of changes that have been reported. And, and these include um, changes in, that I've indicated there. And what you'll see is perhaps the one that is reported most frequently is personal and lifestyle. The individuals have initiated some kind of change. That may not always be what they wanted to do, but were pressed into do by other circumstances. This is followed then by occupational changes, employment status, change of life, location, and then physical and um, psychological health. And what this emphasizes is both the, the importance of both institutional facts, but also personal facts playing out together. So we also identified um, different kinds of knowledge that people need to learn to manage these transitions. These include language and literacy. It could be somebody coming from Australia having to learn English, or it could be somebody coming who is an English speaker but needs to understand the nuances of English language and the way it's used in Australia and, and in the particular work context. There can be the need to learn about the cultural practices, the norms, forms and practices, and political and educational systems, institutional and occupational requirements um, that's particularly pertinent to people, for instance, coming from you know, refugee migrants, for instance, coming from very different countries and perhaps not coming with educational certificates, etc. And then there's learning about the world of work, the requirements for engaging in play, paid employment, being productive, dependable, the requirements for working with others, expectations about solving problems and being responsive to employers and, and clients' needs. And then there's the development of, of or further development of occupational skills that are required to effectively practice um, the occupation or if, are required to actually secure employment. And then there's work-life engagement about how individuals come to engage in, in work life as their circumstances change or are changed for them. So um, what we've identified, as I foreshadowed, is that there are three key mediational means, that is 
three key bases for how this learning arises. And these are person, education, and community. And in terms of personal curriculums, as I've mentioned, there is a pathway of experiences and they're found to be shaped by these three mediational means. That is the individual's capacities, interests, and intentionalities that mediates what they encounter and what they experience and how they respond to it. Then there's education, access to the quality of an outcome of educative experiences. And if this includes those that are afforded by hybrid institutions, such as um, educational institutions, um, TAFE colleges, vocational colleges, universities, but also educative experiences that people find in the workplace um, as part of their, and the community as part of their life. And then we've also found this strong pattern of the way that community um, often uh, provides opportunities, acquaintances, social networks, which permit those transitions to be, to, to be negotiated. And often in their absence, it's those individuals who have struggled to secure effective transitions. So um, what, we, what this suggests is that uh, on its own, lifelong learning efforts, what the individuals does, and lifelong education, the provision of education experiences are insufficient. And that is many opportunities provided happen chances arising and access to other affordances were found in community. So let's have a look at a couple of examples. So Alex is the first person here. He left school at a certain age. He grew up in, in, a, in, a, in an area in Brisbane. He went to the local school. He left school and then he um, was in a, had an apprenticeship. He moved through that. He went through different kinds of work and engaged in different kinds of work activities. And so what we've been able to fo follow him through is, is a series of changes. Um, the second key transition was then becoming a mechanic in, in two different transport companies. And here we follow his um, pathway through his apprenticeship, engaging with particular companies, being involved in, in, in work, and then moving on um, to working in marine work of working on as a diesel mechanic on boats and going through that and developing and gaining a second um, apprenticeship in electrical work in doing so. And then being his work life was disrupted by initially being made redundant, but also the significant changes that occurred with the introduction of electronics. And then because he was redundant, he then took up an, uh, an, another occupational pathway, which was to work with a next door neighbor in bec be becoming a painter. And included in his painting work was work done inside the city hall. And then um, he then became a breakdown mechanic, a roadside me mechanic for the RACQ. And he worked in that role for over 30 years before um, retiring in his 60s. And he had to do that to secure his superannuation. And post-retirement has continued to engage in work of different kinds and has, 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 has engaged in, in a range of activities, work activities peripherally that are associated with his skills. So what we've been able to map with Alex is the way that the, the changes that have occurred and how those changes have been mediated, supported um, um, across these transitions. When we look at um, the changes that these um, almost 30 individuals have experienced, what we find is that these key transition points, which are indicated in the numerical columns there, in most instances, it's a combination of person plus education plus community. So that is at the point when they're having these significant transitions from one form of work to another. It is these three things that come together, which seem to be helpful. What we aren't capturing just in this, by the way, is all of that learning that occurs, the everyday learning that occurs between those key transition points. So what are the implications for, for that here? Well, in terms of intentions, what's suggested is that program design means 
means going beyond the ends in themselves and accounting more for learners earlier and subsequent trajectories, where they heading? And that the importance of RPL and bringing in those earlier experiences and providing guidance and direction for that to be secured. And assessments projecting forward, you know, what will the learning outcomes be used for beyond the course? because the outcomes are uncertain. So, you know, the concerns about developing adaptability rather than passing the exam, you know, perhaps a greater focus on process objectives rather than outcome objectives. And then importantly, trying to get alignments between designers or sponsors and intentions for VET programs, but also students' intentions, spelt incorrectly though I note, and in terms of enactments, um, counselling perhaps before and after participation in VET courses to assist the trajectory to ensure the investment of individuals and institutions is well made, and emphasising engagements outside of educational programmes and institutions, and also a consideration of the use of curriculum and pedagogic practices that are about generating adaptability and privileging educative experiences over educational imperatives, such as those that are often driven by sponsors, such as government, et cetera. And that assessment processes emphasizing the adaptation or adaptability of what has been learned. And in terms of individuals themselves, the importance of them identifying, refining and honing their intentions for participation in programs and deliberately developing capacities for future applications, engagements with others and community to realize their goals and positioning learners as being proactive in their learning and their engagement. So what? So personal curriculum seem important because they, um, um, because they are about knowing individuals' development pathway and how this informs how communities, workplace and governments can afford guidance, support and interventions. And that perhaps existing conceptions of curriculum cannot capture or inform lifespan development, including adults' transitions across working life. And that this shifts a focus from rather than just privileging educational provisions to emphasizing individuals engagement with those provisions and community across working life and placing individuals pathways across the life course center stage in ways not yet perhaps accommodated within the educational discourse. Thank you for that and um, I hope there will be some questions um, that I'll be able to respond to um, either in the chat or afterwards. Associated with this, um, with this talk um, is a short paper and also a handout from the ARC project. So hopefully that's been of some interest and hopefully that then has, um, uh, has will generate some interest and some questions. Thanks very much for your participation.